So good afternoon, welcome to the uh, Flow Focus session. Um, in this next hour, we're going to be covering the aspects of the survey, just a brief overview of um, parts that, Liam, uh, that David didn't cover this morning. Um, and then we're going to have some questions um, at the end. So first of all, we're going to cover the uh, views. Um, sorry, this is the um, survey, the sections that were in the survey that we um, published in 2013 that was answered by about 35% of participants, which was a great um, response. Um, and I'm going to cover the current laboratory practices over the um, programmes that we run. So we asked how many um, fluorescent channels the flow, does your flow cytometer have? There was varying um, numbers returned, minimum number of three, um, maximum of 16, but majority of participants um, running six channels. Um, and then the fluorescent channels used by um, our participants and the median number there was five. So numbers are gradually uh, increasing from the threes and the fours that we saw five, ten years ago. So this is a um, graphical representation of the um, channels used against um, fluorescent channels. And it's showing that Quite a few participants are using their um, cytometers at the maximum, with quite a few um, participants running 10 channels and 10 fluorescent channels as well. So again, as the um, cytometers evolve, so are some participants using their machine to the full. We did see, um, unfortunately, that some participants are still only using one and two uh, fluorescent channels, even though they've got machines that are up to eight colours, which is not best practice, unfortunately. But hopefully, through education, we can uh, get participants using more colours, with the introduction of your flow, especially. Also, automations um, coming along and becoming more widespread. And we asked if uh, participants using automated prep stations and got quite good correspondence between um, the UK and worldwide with 22 and 26% of participants using an automated prep station. Again, that all adds to accuracy of the test itself. The pipetting technique, um, guidelines suggest that participants use reverse pipetting, again, accuracy, with an electronic pipette. And we had a wide range of responses. Majority of participants are still using a manual um, pipette. Um, it's about 15... <laughs> Not as many as there should be people using um, reverse pipetting. And out of the um, people who responded who use electronic reverse and calibration, only 11% were following guidelines. An automated pipette is recommended for mainly accuracy, but also you get an increased risk of RSI if you use a manual pipette. Um, automated pipettes also improve um, the test technically. And as I mentioned earlier, um, automatic prep stations, again, improve the accuracy of the test. So, Throughout the survey and historically, we found that we do get problems with gating, um, your absolute counting method, whether people use guidelines, your fluorochrome choice, your expression of your results, and your antibody choice. And over the whole of the um, 
surveys and findings, we find that these three are the most problematic with CD34 central enumeration seeing problems in all areas. So I'll go on a brief um, overview of CD34. So according to the best practice and the BCSH guidelines, you should be using the ISAGE protocol, single platform, you should use an electronic pipette with reverse pipetting and then count a minimum of 50,000 events or 100 CD34 positive events. So this is our old friend, the ISAGE gating protocol um, developed by Rob Sutherland and Mike Keeney in, I think, 1996. We're still seeing problems with participants missing gates, particularly P5. And we're also, um, we've had participants using the wrong fluorochromes to gate on the CD45 dims. What I would recommend is looking at the guidelines, looking at the Ice Age gating protocol and look at the paper that we published, um, which is the Ice Age gating um, protocol, are we doing it correctly? All these will go through how to set up the Ice Age gating strategy properly. Just one comment, it calls for 7AAD to be used on a patient sample that's fine. On our stabilised samples, unfortunately, the um, fixation process kills the cells. So if you rely on 7AAD to look for the live cells on necros samples, they'll all look dead. So I would recommend you either not use 7AAD on your necros samples or increase the gate to um, incorporate all events. So on the... Um, survey, we had 148 responses to the CD34 questions, and out of those 148, 134 people said they were doing Ice Age. Whether they're doing it uh, correctly or not, they said they're doing Ice Age, so that's what we went on. That then goes down to 123 out of that 148 using single platform. When we looked at electronic pipettes, that went down to 16. Reverse pipetting, 13 out of 148 participants are following the guidelines. With respect to um, the correct number of events being counted, that went down to 12. Then we took into consideration the good laboratory practice of having your pipette serviced and your flow cytometer serviced. That went down to 11. So 7% of um, people who returned um, question or answers for the survey are doing the um, Ice Age, etc. So are following best practice. When we looked at the, whether participants were actually um, carrying out the Ice Age protocol correctly, we found that only 58% we're doing the gating protocol correctly. So if out of that 58% of the 11 doing best practice, that's about seven labs are doing everything correct, which to me is a little bit frightening, especially when there's patients at the end of all this. Again, we, we had very little consensus um, for a lot of the questions we asked on the survey. We've got events counted ranging from 10,000 to, oh crack, is my maths, million? Yes, total events, between 50 and 500 CD34 events. Again, not in line with the guidelines. And then for harvest limits, they range from 5 to 64. And the reporting units, cells per microliter, cells times 10 to the 6 per litre, and cells times 10 to the 9. Throughout all of this, we need consensus from all aspects of the survey showing that there's very little consensus in any testing that we do. On now to the immune monitoring. We had, again, little consensus in um, 
value, uh, units used from cells to microliter, cells times 10 to the 9, cells times 10 to the 6, and then both cells per microliter and cells times 10 to the 9. For subset ranges, a lot of participants were using just in-house ranges. Some, David covered this this morning, a lot are using publications, but the, a lot of the cases, the publication wasn't suitable. And then we'll just co quickly cover, again, what David covered this morning. The, number of samples tested. So all the highlighted participants are using um, ranges created from samples less than recommended. 100 samples give a, gives a confidence limit of 75%, 200 for a confidence limit of 99%. On to, um, looking at pipetting for immune monitoring um, respondees, so out of 224 labs, only 14 were following the guidelines to the letter, or if they're using automatic preparation station, 51. So again, these numbers need to increase. So I'll just hand over to Liam, thank you very much. Right, hi. Um, so, I'm going to carry on with the uh, general theme of the day, which is that we don't agree on anything. Um, I'm going to focus on PNH testing because um, PNH testing is a particularly important test in flow, I feel, because it's a diagnostic test that's used as a go no go for treatment. Um, and the disease is pretty severe um, in that patients are going to die. So, if we miss people when it comes for a PNH test, potentially it can have fatal consequences. So on the survey, when we did meta-analysis, so we looked at every aspect of what people said they were doing, their panels, um, their washers of their red cells. Um, we went through and we, essentially we, we knocked off labs. As soon as you're doing something wrong, one thing wrong means your entire system was wrong. So we knocked people off. We only found 14 laboratories out of 117 that responded that were actually following the international consensus guidelines. Now, the international consensus guidelines are a little bit broad. They have got a certain amount of flexibility in them. Um, but even so, even out of the labs that were following those guidelines, those 14 labs, no two labs were using identical methods. Uh, it's a bit weird. Um, we'd only got five labs testing, uh, we got five labs rather, that were testing only one population of cells. Um, now the, uh, the guidelines do say two, follow two populations of cells, reds, granulocytes or monocytes. Um, we did have three labs, as you can see there, that were only testing red blood cells. But 31% of PNH cases don't have a red cell colon of above 3%. So then, uh, that's somewhere by Rob Sutherland, then that, you, the sensitivity of your assay, if you're only testing one population, the sensitivity of your assay becomes a really big factor. If it's not sensitive enough, you're not going to see anything. Um, now, what we, what we also did is we looked at the sort of gating techniques that people are using um, and sort of uh, the testing protocols. Now, you can see these 14 different gating strategies for granular sites, ranging from the minimum number of antibodies, just using forward side scatter, um, you know, the, the, uh, the 1980s have, have uh, called and they want their gating strategy back. Um, or we've got the maximum number of antibodies, five, just to gate. Um, so we've got anything from the basic to the very complicated. Um, same with monocytes, from one colour to three colour. Red cells is where we saw the most consensus in gating, um, obviously, because you can't really do that much with red cells. So either forward side scatter or up to CD45 and uh, 235A, or glycophorin A in old money. Testing protocols, 26 different for granulocytes, 13 for monocytes, and three for red cells, ranging from just using one fluorochrome, um, on, uh, like flare or uh, CD24, for example, up to using five on granulocytes or four on monocytes. So a lot of variation. That gave us 784 possible combinations for gating and 1,014 for testing, which, if you multiply those two together, that's very close to a million possible combinations, um, which is just, it's a crazy number. I don't understand it. Um, 
But then if you look at the gating um, methods, um, broken them down here, what antibodies people use, in just, not in combinations, just individually, we do start to see some really weird things happening. Granulocytes, we've got one lab that's using CD16 to gate on granulocytes. We've got another lab using CD24. Those are GPI-linked antibodies. You should be using those to test, not to gate. Um, you know, it's, it's just not... We've got a lab here using CD64 for granulocytes. That's a great... CD64 is a great little marker for monocytes. Not really the best for, for, for granulocytes. So it's just... What are we doing? Uh, and this is... I might sound a bit glib. I might sound as if... Um, you know, but honestly, if I didn't laugh, I'd cry. Because we're better than this. We're, we're all better than this. Um, testing methods. Again, no consensus on what GPI linked antibodies to use. We've got fair selection going on. We've still got people using 55 and 59 on granular sites and monocytes. There's been countless publications saying, don't do it. But people still are doing. Even more interesting, we've got two labs using CD14 on granular sites. Uh, obviously, PNH, we're looking for absence of staining. CD14 on granular sites, you all know, doesn't stain up. Therefore, we've got absence of staining. This some of the, it, it's, it's basic stuff, and we need, we need to do better. We really do. We owe, we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to the patients. Now, going on from what um, Andrew Moran was saying earlier, um, now, we, we do need to make sure that staff are actually performing their analysis on flow data, properly trained and competent, because I do think that the analysis of the data is a big area of, sort of the analytical variation in flow cytometry. So, what I've got here, this is just some, uh, some dot plots that I've analysed in Kalooza, which is the call to software. Um, I'm not joking, these are genuine participant dot plots. I've not messed around these in any way. And because it's the LMD format that call to provide, um, which is similar to FCS but slightly um, more bespoke, it means that the gate placements are exactly where the participant placed them. So this is a participant test um, for PNH. So they're using four scatter, side scatter. Um, they've got CD15 side scatter to pick out the granular sites, and then flare and CD24. Um, on paper, that's a decent enough protocol. They've got two GPI-linked uh, reagents. They've got a gating reagent there. But really, I don't think that looks all that good. Um, so if I went through it, forward side scatter plot. We've got forward scatter on a linear scale and side scatter on a log scale, which is very weird. Um, now, I've gone through the guidelines. They don't actually say do forward and side scatter on linear scales, but every diagram of forward and side scatter in the uh, guidelines is on a linear scale. Um, but to use one on linear and one on log is very strange. So that's the first thing. Um, the gate placement on the population. Um, I've, I've drawn my own gate there on the right-hand picture. I think my gate's better than theirs. Um, that's just... It might, might just be me being big-headed, but I do think I'm actually gating on the population there. I think what they're doing is they're getting on a large amount of debris and missing some cells out here. Um, when you do that, when you actually move gate C, you start to see that this large population that starts being a bit of a smear actually looks like two distinct clouds because now I'm actually gating on the granular sites properly. I've got two different populations. So, if I move my marker... I've now gated on what I consider to be the uh, population that's double negative for flare and CD24. Now, the difference between my results is theirs. Theirs is 5.9%. I'm saying 98%. So we've got a difference there of 93% in clone size. Now, for this example, in, obviously it's my opinion, they're not adjusting the side scatter settings. They're losing out on a channel. Side scatter's on the wrong scale. They've got the wrong gate placement. They've got incorrect marker placement. Um, and also, a little pet hate of mine, their gate statistics um, here are overlaying the population they're trying to gate on. You know, just move them out of the way. It's nice to be able to see what you're doing. Um, on the example, so that's there's on the top, that's mine on the bottom. And to me, even though they've gone wrong with the side scatter, the results are night and day. You can still get the right answer. And this shows that even if you've designed your assay correctly, you can still go wrong. Now, for this particular trial, the consensus median was 96%. Now, after the regating, I got it at 98%. That was blind. I had not dug out the report. Um, upper quartile was 99%, so I was in consensus, which is always reassuring for me. But the lab got 5.9%. It's a 96% clone. That's 90% clone missed. 
I would argue that's clinically significant. Now, so that's just when we're analysing it. Post-analytical, we've got lots of variables as well, and obviously in the theme of ISO uh, 15189, these are things you need to look at, naming conventions, assay sensitivities, reporting of results, and this is just for PNH. Naming conventions. Now, they've got to be robust because you're storing the data for a long time. Um, Royal College of Pathologists have said uh, the new one just came out um, very recently, I think in uh, April. Patient records, 30 years. Internal quality control for 10 and EQA for 5. Hands up anybody who can pull back their patient records from, thir from 30 years ago when they were doing flow. Um, you know, I can remember some of the machines having massive tape backups. I bet we've got nothing that will do that nowadays. So that's not great, but we need to put systems in place. Cloud storage is available. Let's, let's use it. Um, and patient records as well. I've spoken with ISO inspectors, and they do consider FCS files to be patient records, not just the final report, not just a printout of the screen, but the FCS files. So we need to store this data for a long time. But if we're storing it for a long time, let's name it something that we can get back to it. And this is, again, seems basic stuff, but we're calling all these files different things. Now, a while ago, we did um, a PNH study with six international centers, and we sent them all some samples and said to them, send your files back so we can analyze them centrally. We wanted to look at um, the effect of central analysis. Um, so we got the files back. Each center had used different naming convention, and each center had labeled their axes differently. So this is the same sample as identified by six separate centers. No two are the same. I'm not saying which is right and which is wrong. And I'm not trying to do that in any of this lecture. But what I'm saying is we can't all be right. We've got to reach some sort of consensus. There's got to be a way we can agree. So that if I sent you some flow files, you would know the patient ID. You would know what I'd stained it on. So that's the, uh, for the tube. Now, if we look at the standard reagent, because we sent reagents out, we've got four different naming conventions um, for the flare. Flare Alexa, Flare Fitzy. Flare, just straight, and Flare AF488. Now, I know that some of those are right and some of those are wrong. I did say, I, you know, I'm not saying what's wrong, but I will say that Flare is not produced on Fitzy. Flare is produced on Alexa Flow 488. So Flare AF488, that's okay. Flare Alexa, I'd, I'd say that that's probably all right. Flare Fitzy doesn't exist. 25 years down the line, how are you going to go through that? Because it doesn't exist. It comes through on the FL1 channel, but it's not reagent. Well, then we've got three labs that just label it flare. No fluorochrome information. At the moment, that's okay, because it's only on Alexa floor, but what happens six months down the line if they decide to release a Pacific Blue or a FICO erythrin version of that? So we've got to do things a little bit differently. Um, solutions, we need to sort of develop our naming conventions just with a longer term objective to actually store this data. We're supposed to do it. We've got to do it. We've got to label experiments consistently. We've got to log all the reagent batch use as per the sort of uh, multicolor guidelines. I know we keep going on about them that Ulrike Hansen wrote, but they're a great document. They're a brilliant document. It's just, it, it just needs to be implemented. Um, so I think uh, we've, got a, we've got a lot of concerns. We've, we're quite worried about a lot of things in flow in general and with uh, PNH in particular. Um, I would say as well, because I am, uh, one thing about the Barnes report and the Royal College of Pathologists report um, was that all EQA programs should be designed with patient safety in mind. Now, whilst we are supposed to remember we're here to provide a service to labs to identify performance, patient safety is what we're after. We're trying to get labs performing better because there's patient safety at the end of it. Um, and with patient safety in mind, I will point out to some of you guys that I know that there's some ISO inspectors in this room that will be coming to your labs. And obviously, they know that they've heard this now. They know the areas they're going to be looking at. You know the areas that they're going to be looking at. Because you can't sort of expect them to walk in and say, well, you're not doing this. Well, we never thought about it. Speaking of, we've gone through ISO, put things right now. Um, it's a lot of work, but if you put it right after ISO have been, you have to do twice as much paperwork because you have to do the ISO paperwork as well and they give you a timeline of three months. So right now, you've got a timeline as long as you need until ISO get in, and you only have to do half the paperwork because you've not got to do the non-compliant stuff. So I'd really encourage you all to sort of start making a move on all these things that we've been talking about. Now, just 
really quick, I'll just uh, finish off just talking about the ANSI sensitivity of PNH. Um, as I was saying, lots of different levels of sensitivity. Again, no concordance, 0.1% to 5%. Methods for how you actually determine sensitivity are showing variation as well. We're doing things in different ways. But more interestingly, uh, quite interesting, I like these three methods for determining assay sensitivity. Uh, decided by a pathologist, not done, and by experience. Cracking. Um, I've got to be honest, um, a UCAS inspector will just tear you apart with that. You can't do it. You've got to do some proper sensitivity studies. You know. So, uh, and then we go on to the report and the results. This is for PNH, and I know Steve, obviously, they run the sort of uh, National Reference Centre along with King's, but if you actually look, and I'm sure he'll jump up and shout things at me, but in the guidelines it says to you very clearly how you should report, uh, you should be reporting the clone present, clone absent, not positive, negative. You should be reporting the size of the clone so it can be monitored. So actually, only a third of centres are actually doing it properly. And it's there in the guidelines. You know, it, we keep, I know I keep hopping about it, but we're just reinventing the wheel. So that's one of the things with PNH. And obviously, we're that concerned about it. We have actually gone to um, Alexion, which is the, uh, the company that makes Eclusimab, and said, PNH testing in this country, yeah, we've got, we've got leads and kings that are doing it great, you know, doing it really well. But we've only got, we've got a lot of labs, the vast majority that aren't. Um, and so what they've actually done is they've given us an unrestricted educational grant to run some courses on PNH testing. Now we've got some, um, we've got some folks that are going to kindly talk on that. Um, Steve's going to talk on it. Uh, Dan Payne, um, he's going to be talking on it. We're also going to be flying in Rob Sutherland and Andrea Illingworth uh, from the States um, who've written and been involved in the guidelines and a lot of publications. So if you are doing PNH, um, I would hope I've shown you there that there's lots for us to be scared about seriously go away and look at your techniques. If you do nothing else after this lecture, just at least look at your technique. If you want to do something more, we are running some courses. There's a, um, there's a lovely girl outside on the front desk called Eleanor, and she's taking registrations. The first course is in a fortnight, which I know is a short amount of time to sort of think, can I get free? But at the end of the day, there's a patient behind this, and we're all working on behalf of that patient. And I think we owe it to them to actually do these tests better. So I'd encourage people to actually look at the flyers in your, um, in your pack. And on your way out, uh, get out there and put your names down because we've only got limited spaces on each course. So that's where we are with PNH, and that's where we're actually trying to do something um, to actually fix the problems that we've uh, identified. I'm going to stop going on now. I'm going to turn you over to Matt, who's going to talk to you a little bit about MRD, a little bit about low-level leukocyte enumeration, and then we'll go on to the questions that uh, you guys have kindly provided. Okay, so this is just another data extraction from the uh, survey that we did, uh, which we've been talking about. Um, this just shows you how many tests most labs are doing on a monthly basis. Uh, just a min minimal residual disease in general, not looking at uh, disease breakdown. And you can see that the vast majority there, 80% of centres, are doing um, 0 to 50 tests per month. And uh, then you've got your more specialised centres further down there that are seeing up to uh, 150, 200 uh, cases per month. So this is a breakdown of the disease types that are being looked at uh, by these centres and you can see that most centres are testing a wide range of disease types, um, BALL -B -A -L -L being the most prevalent at 87%, but uh, it's pretty, pretty uniform across the board with most uh, laboratories turning their hands to all, all the diseases. And again, if you look at the bottom table there, uh, most centres are, are testing more than uh, one disease type. And this is a slide that uh, David p covered earlier, so I won't, won't dwell on it, but it just highlights the uh, the wide range in the uh, different uh, times for the follow-up samples. Um, and as, as mentioned earlier, you've got uh, some centres that are
testing their follow-up sample on day one, one day post-treatment, um, and then you've got others that are completing all four samples within a 30-day period, which is clearly not uh, acceptable. Most centres, though, you know, are doing at least one, one uh, sample, 100% there, uh, but we do get uh, three labs dropping off when it comes to looking at a second follow-up sample. So there are three labs out of that pool of 46 that were only testing one follow-up sample. And maybe one of those was the one that was testing that one follow-up sample at one day post-treatment. Now, I'm going to just go back to the uh, previous slide there. Oops. No, I'll, stay, I'll stay on this one. Um, you'd, you saw from the earlier uh, table there that most uh, laboratories are now offering a range of uh, disease types when it comes to MRD. Currently, um, NEQAS only offer the ALL um, MRD program, but we are looking at introducing uh, an AML MRD program and a CLL uh, program later this year. Now, with that in mind, we have recently carried out a small-scale study with uh, 20 centres, uh, in which we sent out to um, AML samples with a, a level of 3% disease and 1% disease, and we've had 19 returns from those 20, which is quite, quite a good uh, return rate, and uh, generally excellent consensus. There are a couple of uh, flyers on there, um, we've got one here that's slightly underestimating and another one further down there that's overestimating, but generally that's, uh, that's great for an initial send out um, on the AML, AML study. And if I can just go on to the uh, quick uh, stats table that we did there, um, they, they are very tight. So we're looking at following that up with a, a second send out um, to the same labs. We're going to take on board comments that we've received back about the sample quality and how the, the results should be submitted. So we'll be asking for um, disease a, a percentage of uh, PBMCs and uh, total white cell count uh, and uh, hopefully going um, live with a, a pilot study by the end of uh, this year for AML MRD. A similar study for CLL wasn't quite as successful. Um, we sent that out to 12 labs but only had six returns and quite a spread of results, to be honest. Um, I suppose the three here are, are the closest, um, but there's, there's a whole range from 0 0.015 up to 0.6. Um, that sample was sent out at 0.5% uh, minimal residual disease, and then we had sample 1B sent out at 0.2, and sample 1C was sent out at 0.05% disease. I am looking at uh, repeating that study and I'm wanting to recruit extra labs because uh, clearly six, six centres is not uh, statistically significant. So if any of you do want to partake in a CLL MRD study, please drop me a line and uh, we'll make up some samples and get those, those sent out and again hopefully go live with a, a CLL programme towards the end of this year. So, low-level leukocyte enumeration, one of our oldest and one of our smallest programs. We have uh, 90 participants in the low-level uh, leukocyte enumeration program, 11 of those based in the UK. And uh, this program developed back in the 80s, um, for those that you don't know, that on the back of the uh, mad cow disease scare back then, uh, when it was suspected that... Uh, the infective agents that could cause CJD hid inside white blood cells. So um, all blood, you, blood services decided they were going to uh, leukodeplete all their products. So we leukodeplete products in-house and then artificially spike in a very small amount of white blood cells. So you would expect with uh, such an established program that there would be consensus. And going back to the general theme of this uh, uh, questionnaire. If you look at the uh, range of products tested by uh, blood validation services, um, the guidelines recommend that you test 1% of your products, which 
to be fair, 47% the largest cohort there are, are uh, testing 1% of their products. At the other end, you've got uh, two labs that say they're testing 100% and they're testing all of their blood, blood products for leukodepletion, which seems a, a ridiculous amount of work. Um, but to, the general take home message again there is that there's no consensus. And when we looked at the UK labs as well, the 11 UK labs, there, there was no consensus between the UK centres. Similarly, for the uh, limits of rejection, um, again, no consensus. Um, one centre was stating two different rejection rates uh, for red cells and platelets. Um, just a whole mix across the board, and again, absolutely no consensus between the UK labs, even though this programme has been running with 11 or 12 labs for about 30 years. So that uh, concludes all the talk about the questionnaire and uh, the depression about how there is a lack of uh, agreement. So we've gone on to some pre-supplied questions that uh, some of you guys have sent through to us prior to the meeting. Um, so first one was asking if we were going to uh, develop any programs um, such as CVID B cell panels or ALP screens. Well, we, we're not, we haven't got any plans to develop those programs, but uh, as, we, as with all other things, if, if uh, there's sufficient need out there, then um, we will consider uh, developing those, those programs. So it's up, it's up to, to you guys to get in touch with us. If, if there's any interest out there, we can certainly look at uh, providing you with a program but uh, currently we, we don't have uh, any plans to release those programmes. Um, as I've mentioned just a while ago, we are looking at introducing AML and CLL um, MRD programmes this year, and uh, hopefully next year looking at introducing myeloma uh, MRD as well. And we are, will be introducing an alternative technologies immune prop monitoring programme this year as well for uh, users of the Aquios system. And uh, in terms of other developments, the PNH and H high resolution PNH programs, which currently run as two separate programs, one issuing uh, PNH clones over 1% and the other around, uh, well, less than 1%. We're going to merge those two programs. Uh, so instead of subscribing to two separate programs, you would su subscribe to just one generic PNH program. And uh, that would just have six send outs a year instead of the current four for both of the programs. Right, so next question is how can we apply the concept of root cause analysis to improve the quality of diagnoses made on the basis of flow cytometry data? So I can throw that over, over to you guys if you want. <laughs> um, this is what um, we do, um, root cause analysis. Do you have an SOP? Yes. Is it correct? Yes. Was it followed? Yes, was the person sufficiently trained? If the answer to any of those is no, well, that's your problem. Um, and then you have to follow that up with your, your CAPA form. Now, um, that leads on to the next question with what is needed to have an effective CAPA process, our RCA system. Um, this is what we currently have. Uh, this is our, our CAPA form. Um, in the top panel there, we have a uh, description of your incident. We categorise that as major, minor, near miss, or a complaint. Um, in the bottom box, we put our root cause analysis, and then the cap a bit is at the top of the second page there, where we have corrective action for the team and uh, any preventative um, measures to be implemented. And then at the bottom of the form there, um, asking if feedback was required and or, or given and then that can be signed off by the uh, quality manager and uh, director and these will be discussed at our, our quality meetings and staff meetings as well to close off the loop.
is it ever acceptable to stay in its cells and fix for running the next day? Um, does anybody do that? <laughs> we certainly don't. We, in short term, fix the samples overnight and then stain them and run them the next day, but we've never, never stained cells the day before for running the next day. Um, is that something that anybody does? No? No, it's not. Um, another question that we uh, received was about the MRD program. Um, currently, in the stats tables for the MRD program, we just show the IBFM group and uh, all participants' data. Um, I had a participant asking if we could supply other treatment protocols, such as the NOFO panel and similar. Um, that's, that's potential, potentially doable, yes, um, but we do require at least 20 participants in each little group to make this stats significant. We currently have like 23 um, centres submitting results for the IBFM panel, but only have about 16, 17 routinely submitting for NOPFO. So if we could get that up to 20, then certainly there's no problem including those stats in the report. Um, as a short-term fix, if anybody did require that data, it would be no problem just to do a quick results pull. I could supply you with means, and uh, you could calculate your own z-scores and compare it to the NOPFO group. Um, but to say uh, we need 20 at least to make it statistically viable from our point of view. Um, I don't know if the person that, that submitted this question is is in, in the uh, room at all, but uh, want, wanted some discussion about um, sensitivity of MRD and PNH panels and what different labs we're using. No? No? Draw in a blank. Okay. Yes? Yeah, sure. well, I know I've not got a microphone, but I think my voice carries. I think uh, the same different sensitivity of different labs, I think we've shown all the way through. Every lab's got different sensitivities because every lab is using different methods. And as you saw from the slide I showed, where labs Well, labs just aren't even doing their sensitivity, as, as we saw earlier, by experience. Um, I think um, whilst it is true different labs have different sensitivities, it shows it's a foundation problem. It's, at the, it's not due to their techniques. It's how people are either doing or not bothering to do sensitivities in the first place. And that's why I think different ranges exist. comment mainly based on the MRD scheme for B lineage leukemia, uh, ALL. I think people are probably extrapolating a NEQAS data to be inferred as a sensitivity. And of course, you know, by nature of your, your matrix you send out blasts in peripheral blood. It's a much easier matrix and post treatment marrow. And you know, we see people reporting down to, you know, one per million, which is just, you know, I think unachievable in, you know, post-treatment marrow. But, so I think, you know, the sensitivity question is difficult and, you know, we have to be slightly careful that we don't drive an illusion through the EQA samples that actually we can detect leukaemia down to that level or PNH down to that level, because I'm not sure that is the case. Totally agree with that, Paul. Um, and that's one thing that we do try to be aware of, is that the EQA samples obviously are a snapshot in time. And we're just saying, on a, on a level of this, did you pass or fail? Um, it's not a measurement of people's sensitivities, but people are using it as such. And we do have to be careful. Just because we issue a low-level sample, which we will do on time to time, we're supposed to issue challenging samples. That Just because you pass that challenging sample is not us rubber stamping your sensitivity of your assay, it's just us saying on sample X you detected that population. Um, it could be that your sensitivity is better than that, which is up to you to prove. It could be that your sensitivity is not down to that level and you just got the right answer. So I think the sensitivity of your assay should, NEQAS samples should support your sensitivity data, but they shouldn't be your sensitivity data.
So, uh, yeah, I think that's a very good point. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure how many of these <laughs> we've got left. Um, keep scrolling. Um, we would like to have a discussion and suggestions about different gating me methods and how you decide whether populations are positive or negative. Anybody like to uh, contribute? I mean, presumably, um, the National Academy, one of the raison d'etre for it is to actually be a, a forum for this sort of thing. So what, what we've not had for a long time, as far as I know, is, is that such a forum where you, you, you can have guidelines all over the place, but people have to read them, they have to interpret them. If you get people round together in a workshop, then you've got a real chance of actually cutting down on a lot of that diversity. Uh, you'll never achieve 100% consensus, I guess. But, I mean, given if, if that, am I right in assuming that is one of the reasons for setting it up? Is there any fundamental objection in the room to, to actually participating? I mean, I, I would think that with a strong argument, if, if once, you know, the, this funding stream for the PNH has been used up, that you could argue to all sorts of bodies that there are, there's a really good reason why you should fund us to allow all the flow cytometrists from every lab in the country to attend one of these meetings such that we can achieve standardisation. I mean, does anybody object to the, to the use of it? Do you think you can do it on your own bat? I mean, I, I, is anybody from the National Blood Service here? Because I would say to them, for the low-level Luke site, why doesn't the MBS run a workshop itself for its 11, 12 labs and actually sort that problem out that Matthew showed us? Um, are there any guidelines for preparing cells from bone marrow with plasma site infiltration? Uh, I had a look and I can't see any. Um, if anybody else knows otherwise, then uh, feel free to, <laughs> to uh, share the information. But I, I couldn't see, see anything on, on a quick Google search and a quick trawl through uh, various journals. Um, so I'm afraid I can't help you with that one. Um, how have labs gone about estimating the uncertainty of measurement for their flow cytometry assays and can we establish methods of uncertainty in flow cytometry for other markers than the uh, common subsets there? Again, I guess it comes down to uh, you know, the, the course and uh, <laughs> you know, making sure that we're all singing from the same uh, song sheet. Yeah, I think it comes down to as well uh, some of the lectures that we've already heard earlier today as well discussing methods of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously it's uh, it's things that we've heard today, and it's things that we plan to sort of uh, teach on this uh, on the course, so we can actually get some consistency going across flow. I think as well, it's, it's easier for uh, for people to open up on a course. I know this is a bit can be a bit intimidating to. Um, have an opinion, so uh, it's, uh, it's a lot more intimate on a course and it does give you the opportunity socially as well to, to meet with some of the experts and uh, discuss uh, uh, the opinions in a, perhaps a less intimidating forum. Um, and I think this is the last one actually. Um, we had a question of someone that's interested in the um, stabilities of open vials, it's not something that uh, we, we do in, in NECLAS, so I mean, if anybody, again, um, has got any information about open vial stabilities, um, done any studies into open vial stabilities? Question up there, Joe. I think that's probably mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, what Mm -hmm. So what you do with it in that time? So 
A, a lab where they had a new cold room installed and they left the reagents, all the fluorescents, <coughs> on the top uh, shelf with the light on and they had photo bleaching over the weekend, so none of the reagents worked. So can I ask as a show of hands, how many people actually pre-test the reagents when you get them from the manufacturers? For example, plotting donor molecule against acceptor molecule. Is that nobody? So how do you know that they're degrading? You don't, so in which case you won't know how, how long your open spa stability is because you've got no starting point to compare to. I was just saying the open vial is the moment that you take the foil cap off the bottle, not leaving it open. It's back in the fridge, it's cold, it's dark, and then taken out on in, at the appropriate intervals. The issue you've got here is that actually if a manufacturer says that the open bar stability or the expiry date of reagent is a year, that's what UCAS judge you by. So if you use it a year and one day, you have to validate that use. And then that becomes very difficult and problematic because how often do you run that validation? You've got an issue with manufacturers, I suspect. Sorry if any manufacturers are in the room, but where a lot of these um, used by dates are just assigned. I mean, we've all we all know from years ago that you know fluorescein antibodies will last for donkey's years, and you know others fall apart. But actually, you can only go by a manufacturer's guidance now. So if they say open vial three months, that's where you cast are at at the moment with it. So I don't know whether that's helpful, but you know. All the stuff about how many times it's been in and out of the fridge isn't measurable or judged. It's, you know, if, if it's set at three months, that's what you assess by. Can I just make a comment that if that is true, then that is impractical for the vast majority of labs testing. And you might want to consider moving to a different manufacturer. Seriously, because the amount of wastage of those reagents is going to be huge. I mean, we're all used yeah, to this, this is a debate we've quickly. had with the manufacturers, so uh, they are aware of the problem um, and they're taking steps to, to help us out. Um, we are, like I guess a lot of people, have got a, a contract with a particular manufacturer which makes it impractical to move, certainly in the short term. 
We're just about to go out to tender the flow cytometers, which is likely to include reagents. I will put a clause in our tender stipulating that reagents should be certainly usable up until the expiry date, whether they're open or closed. It's worth exploring, and there are. Um, we are, uh, had a couple of discussions on the topic with the particular manufacturer. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say, I mean, obviously we're, we're dancing around the names of the manufacturers, I'm not trying to jump in there, but I do know that the, the main two manufacturers, BD and Beckman Coulter, BD are starting to do lyophilized one flow reagents that are the Euroflow panel. Uh, Beckman Coulter will do your Duraclone mixers, which is your own panel, and they will do your pre done tubes, which will lyophilize. The um, use by date, I know on the Duraclone from Beckman Coulter is two years, and they're looking at pushing that out to three. Um, and I think it's round about the same level on BD on the one flow system. I think that's about two years. So if you are finding that your wet reagents have got too short a shelf life, maybe it's the time to go dry. That's hopefully what we're going to do. Oh, there you go. Okay, so that's, uh, I think that's the end of the pre supplied questions and of this uh, forum. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, if anybody would like to take part in the CLL MRD study, uh, drop me a line at matthew.fletcher at ukneckwiseli.co.uk.